Good morning. Hope you all are doing okay. Hope you're alive and well, both online, here in the big room. Yesterday was awesome. So before we start, let me thank you guys. I think we had over half the church show up for that. And uh, many hands made light work, I think. Well, not too light. Uh, a lot of us are hurting today, but uh, about 6,000 pounds of mulch, I think people moved. And uh, I'm just so thankful for you guys. We are doing our best to make these environments ready for Easter, for the big comeback when many experts are saying a lot of people who have vanished for the last year are planning to make their return. We want to be ready for the lost and our neighbors and our family and our friends. And I thank you guys. You worked hard. This place looks amazing. Tomorrow morning, say a prayer at 7.30 a.m. Something big starts to happen in this room. And then the following Monday at the same time, for the next three days after that, something even bigger that's never happened in 17 years happens in this room. So Easter morning, you're going to see a whole new place. It's going to look awesome. I'm so fired up. And thank you guys again for your selflessness. Some of you were here for hours and hours and uh, couldn't, couldn't make this place look any better without you. I'm going to put a picture up in just a second. And I want you to shout out if you recognize what the world's largest bird is. Okay? All right. Here we go. Right here. What do you think? Well, I heard a whisper. Somebody's not very brave, but you're right. Condor. Who said that? Look at you. Nice, Kathy. All right. That is an Andean condor. Not just any condor. An Andean condor. Now, these things are so... Now, this, some of you are like, oh, it's an ostrich. That's the biggest one. No, that's, that's a land bird. That doesn't do anything. I don't think they fly, right? Because if they do, that'd be frightening. It's not an emu. This is the largest soaring bird of prey, okay? Now, just to give you context for its 10-foot wingspan... Here is a picture of that same bird going after, wait for it, a wolf. <laughs> okay? Think of it. Not a badger, not a ferret, a wolf. And by the looks of it, the wolf is pretty freaked out. Okay? There are, it has seen better days. Okay? So it has a 10 foot wingspan, and they have been spotted flying for more than five hours at a time, covering, wait for it, 100 miles. 100 miles. How do they do that? I mean, think about it. That, what, what's a marathon? 20, 20, 26? Okay, all right. 20, anybody run those? Okay, good. No. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, I just know it, right? So that's like four times a marathon. These birds have been tracked and spotted. Y'all, that exhausts me just thinking about it, going 100 miles. I, I'm tired. Like, I circle Walmart parking lot like one time trying to find a spot just so I can walk closer into the store. Like if Krispy Kreme's got the drive through backed up, it, it ruins my day. We're, we're so, we're so like, like just like fat, happy, and content. And this kind of stamina blows my mind. So how do they do it? How do they fly over 100 miles soaring without taking a break over five hours? And I looked into this because they know a secret. Something I didn't even think about. The reason they can soar for five hours at covering 100 miles is because they spend just 1% of their time aloft, flapping their wings. Huh? Some of you hadn't caught it yet. Oh, get ready. The secret is this. Once they are airborne, once they are aloft in the air, all they do is rely on the power of the wind to keep them soaring. Does that make sense? See, it's not the power of the bird itself. It's the power of the wind that keeps them aloft. Some of you see where this is going. In the Christian life, it's the wind of the Spirit of God that gives us our power. It's supposed to be. It's the wind of the Holy Spirit that gives us stamina and strength to carry on when we're suffering. When all we see is our scars. When we look around and we think, oh my goodness, could this world get any more messed up? How do we, how do we continue? How do we run and not be weary? How do we walk and not faint like Isaiah? And we touched on this a little bit last week. The secret is to lean into Jesus, to tap into that recharging source that only he can provide spending time with him in prayer, spending time with him in Bible study, gathering together in a worship community where we come together and we sing and we encourage each other. He lifts us up. You can feel it when we sing. It's the highlight of my week. I love it. Somebody says, hey, why don't you go do this? I'm like, no, no, this is my time. I'm not working the room during this. This is my, I don't have a hidden church somewhere else that I sneak off to and go worship. This is it. This is the highlight. I love, love this time because it energizes us. It is the thing that, that puts that wind under our wings. And everywhere you look, people need this. Everywhere you look, people are so tired. They're so exhausted because the world's hard. Times are tough right now. So many people are suffering from one thing or another. 
but they're not totally unexpected sufferings. And that's what we looked at last week, trying to pull back and take that heavenly perspective. And you remember, we looked at John 16, 33, where Jesus said these seven sobering words, in this world, you will have trouble. Well, the good news is what happens next, and we'll get to that. But I want to pick up where we left off. You remember, we talked about suffering, and we, we just touched on the nature of free will and evil and the fall of man and the temptation that came over Adam and Eve and how they fell in the, in the garden when they chose to disobey. And you remember all that. Today, we're going to do something so fun. We're going to go all the way back further to the beginning of recorded history. And we're going to dive deep and see where and how it all began. We're going to look at the origin of suffering and the origin of evil. And it is going to open our eyes to see so much about our ancient enemy, the adversary. And he's known by a lot of names. Probably the two most popular ones that you know of are the devil and Satan, right? He's got a hundred names, but these are the two most popular ones. But here's the thing. When we grow up in a, in a Western country, we, we think most of our upbringing and our theology comes from Bugs Bunny or from cartoons like this. This is what we think of when we think about the devil, right? Kind of a chubby guy in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork. And, you know, we, we just, we just kind of think, oh, the devil's just a, a guy who makes bad jokes and occasionally pokes us <laughs> with his pitchfork or something. No, this is not biblical. This interpretation, half the country thinks this is what the devil is. This is not your enemy. This is not the adversary. The Bible paints a far different picture than this. So to find the truth, to find the origin, you go to the scriptures, you look in the Old Testament, and we learned that he was originally one of the most charismatic, beautiful, angelic creations ever made. I mean, he was absolutely breathtaking. In Hebrew, the word used to describe him is almost like a name, and it is Hallel. Hallel is that word that, in our English language, it was trans translated into Lucifer, meaning light bearer, or light bringer, or maybe the brightness, or the morning star. We see that in Isaiah 14, 12. There's a verse that says, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. Scripture refers to Lucifer by so many other names, all of which, every single one, don't miss this, describes his fallen nature. None of his names from this point on describe his glorified nature. All of them are things like the thief, the accuser, the prince of darkness, the king of Tyre, the king, uh, the father of lies, the day star, the accuser of the brethren. But I want to point something out. Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, whatever name you give him, he is not the evil counterpart to God. He is not, this is not like the yin and yang where you've got God on one side and the devil and they have this fight. And they're like, oh, we're going to duke it out. I'm going to poke you. You're the white angel on this. You're the red angel on this shoulder. It is not like that. Where does that come from? That comes from the enemy. So that you think this is an equal fight. Satan, never forget, is a created being. We know he had a definite beginning. We're going to see that in the scriptures. And we know he has a definite end result where we see the lake of fire coming up. And I want to point out something interesting. Here's a hidden gem that a lot of people miss. Once he rebels against God and he is cast out of heaven, as we're going to read in a second, I want you to notice that he is never, ever referred to as Lucifer again. Why? It's almost, almost like because he's made this choice to rebel against his creator, that he is stripped. He loses his regal name. He loses the right to be called, no longer entitled to that original, beautiful, regal, lofty ministry that he once held, as we'll see. So if I were to ask you, who is, and we unanimously shout it out, who is the greatest Christian rock band of all time? You would say, <laughs> skillet, pillar, not bad. Say it again, Milo. That's my son. Striper. Now, y'all remember a few years ago, they put out an album that dealt with this right here, and this was Fallen. And here you see God kicking loose for the, uh, the fallen angel, the angel of light, if you will, out and down. Now, how amazing is it that as I teach on this today, they release a brand new album called Even the Devil Believes. And I want you to notice the crispiness of Lucifer at this point, how he is back. This is right before the judgment. Seated before the throne, you see the four faces of the angel, the seraphim and the cherubim, and we'll talk about all that. And you see that even he has to bow. So don't miss this. He is a created being who has a purpose now, and he has an end result awaiting him. He is not an equal with God. 
He is not a yin and yang companion that goes against God. Before all this happens, though, we get to read the history of Lucifer and how he came to this moment when he has to kneel, when every knee will confess, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, just like we see right here. There's a history of him, and it's found in Ezekiel 28. So if you want to read along, you can join the story. This is the origin and description we find, Ezekiel 28, starting in verse 12. He says this, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald, all apparently interwoven with gold the workmanship of your timbrels and your pipes. Okay, these are like musical instruments. So when Lucifer walked by in the fiery stones, we'll see even the tiny little timbrel, it's like he made music. Like the very creation of him somehow was tied to music and he was gorgeous. And when he walked into the room, every eye would follow. He was that stunning. Okay, the musical instruments were prepared for you on the day you were created. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Okay, this is in God's presence. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. There it is, created. From this description, we see this specific angelic being is quite possibly the most stunning, the most breathtaking, radiant, impressive creature the Lord has ever made. The Lord says of him, you were the seal of perfection. You were full of wisdom. Okay, so he wasn't an idiot. He wasn't just like, just like good looking and dumb. He was full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. And right here we see that Lucifer was among the wisest beings God ever created. No other angel is given this description of this kind of intelligence, this kind of beauty, perfect in beauty. He is literally described as perfection and what comes with this beauty. So out of the more than 100 million angels that we estimate there are, only this one is given the title of the ultimate of wisdom, the ultimate of perfection, the ultimate of beauty and charisma and intelligence. And the influence he had over them was stunning. It was incredible. As we dig deeper, I want you to look at verse 14. Notice this statement. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Don't miss that because this is, goes back to his role. A lot of people say, oh, this was talking about an earthly king like the king of Babylon or the king of Tyre. But when you look at this, this right here disqualifies it. I don't see how this is applying to a human. And that's why, because verse 14, it says, you are the anointed cherub. Cherubim are not related to humans. They're a separate class, just like seraphim. Cherubim is the plural for cherub. This is where we get a cherubim, right? So we see that this description doesn't fit a human. There's the anointed cherub of God. And when you remember, cherubim are totally separate because they guard God's holy presence. He has this unapproachable majesty, this very special and unique position. And we first see the cherub in the Garden of Eden. We talked about a little bit last week where once Adam and Eve were evicted, what does God do to stop them from coming back in? He places a cherub there with a giant flaming sword to prevent them from coming in lest they eat and live forever in their sin. So we see him there. And then we see him pop back up when Moses makes the Ark of the Covenant. I got a shirt here. It just happens to be, I don't know, just a random shirt. This is a concert shirt from Michael Sweet. What's on the cover? Ark of the Covenant. Look what's on the lid. These are cherubim. Notice what they do. Don't miss this. These two cover with their wings God's glory. This is when it was placed in the Holy of Holies. The Shekinah glory of God would come and dwell literally between these two cherubs. And he would come, they would dwell, and the high priest got to meet with him once a year and sprinkle blood for the atonement of sins. And this was this amazing thing. Th think about this in context to the role Lucifer was said to have as the anointed cherub who, what? Who covers, just like you see on the holy lid of the Ark of the Covenant. So evidently, before his fall, Lucifer was this cherub. His position was so lofty that he had this place of honor and distinction right beside God, protecting his holiness. So he had one of the highest if not the highest positions in all angelic host, right up there alongside Michael, the archangel. Think about that. But yet somehow he would come to despise this. Why? Sometimes he would come to despise this position and he would actually lose this position. Think about this. We have here in Ezekiel, 
the highest of God's creatures, perfect in wisdom, beyond beautiful in description. He's gifted. He's a musician on top of all this. He's given this high, exalted, prestigious position that any one of us would love, had everything going for him, but he also had free will. And something happens. He exercises this free will, and the entire universe is about to feel the effects. Look at what happens in verse 15. He says this, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. Here it is, till iniquity was found in you. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. So I cast you to the ground. So think about this. One day, this marvelous creature, God turns and says, iniquity was found in you. So what happened? Why? Why would God say that? Every time I read this, you know me, I'm weird. I flash back to Star Wars. Y'all remember Master Yoda, who had this confrontation with Count Dooku? Count Dooku was a great, gifted, wise Jedi. Yoda loved him, mentored him, and trained him. And then all of a sudden, he has to confront him. And he senses something's not quite right. And Yoda says, the dark side, I sense in you. Right? You remember this? And what is Count Dooku's response? I love this. He says, the dark side, I says, he says, I've become more powerful than any Jedi, even you. And with that, he shoots lightning at Yoda. And it is on like Donkey Kong playing Ping Kong in Hong Kong. It is, it is an epic battle that goes for like 10 minutes. This great scene. This is what I picture. They're standing there. Think about this. Here's God gazing out across eternity. The fiery stones, he's on the mountain. He's, he's looking out over the Garden of Eden. And he senses Lucifer approach standing near him. But something has changed. And God makes a statement that would rattle the universe from that moment forward. He looks over and he says, I find iniquity in you. Lucifer, what have you done? What, what has changed about you? So what's iniquity? What is that? Why would he use that word? It's defined literally as villainy, as sin that is wicked and evil. So what was it? Scripture actually gives us a glimpse, if you look for it, into what his downfall was. If we go back to Isaiah chapter 14, look what he says. This is Lucifer's mindset. For you, Lucifer, have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. That's not high enough. I will be like the most high. Wow. Some translations don't even have the word like. It literally is translated, I will be the most high. Did you notice how many I wills there are? Notice how many times he says the word I. And it just reminds me of his arrogance. It's so breathtaking. When you see the word pride, what's the middle letter in the word pride? It's I. Think of how much he says I, I, I. And he's going on and on. Satan is not content with his created role. He is talking about the entire angelic host. Remember, stars don't refer to the night sky. They refer to the other angelic host that is all around him. In other words, he is saying, I want to sit above them all. I want to take over heaven. I will be God. That is Lucifer's sin, and that is the iniquity that's found. He wants to sit on a throne above even that of God's. He doesn't want to do what he was created to do. He wants to do his own thing. He wants to be served, not serve God. And ultimately, he wants to be worshipped as God. So God cast him down. And when he fell, we see he did not fall alone. Some experts say, oh, there were 70 watcher gods that came with him. Some say, oh, no, it was far more than that. Revelation 12, 4 gives us another hint and says, he, the dragon drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to earth. Think about that. A third that joined his rebellion. And once these angels were cast out of heaven, they're no longer worthy of their angelic names. And Lucifer, from that moment on, becomes known as the adversary. The Satan, if you want to be correct about it. It's not supposed to be a proper noun. Not supposed to be capital. English just did that. Satan isn't his name. We knew what his name was. Now he is simply known as the adversary, the one of rebellion. And all the fallen angels who went with them, the Koine Greek had a word called diamonian, a creepy word from where we get the word demon. That is how we know. As they continue to seduce, they continue to whisper their lies and their deceit, they continue to swarm around, sowing dissension among the brethren until the appointed day when God will deal with all of this. And the lake of fire was created.
for this reason. It was never created for humanity to be thrown in. Go back and read what the Lord says. All of this is an after effect from this moment. Now you know why. Looking back, you see why Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. So with that as the background, now we go forward and we look at two passages about suffering here in the New Testament. And if anyone knows about suffering besides the Lord Jesus, it's the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, oh my goodness, he went through everything. And what we're about to read in this passage, he is addressing, again, some arrogant, boastful, proud, fake apostles who have gone out of their way and they are ruining things. They are sowing dissension and false doctrine and they are leading so many good people astray. In fact, at this point, they're even bragging about their <clears throat> spirituality. And Paul has finally had enough. And Paul says, stop. You think you're so great? You think you're so special? You think you're qualified? And then he goes on to say this. Are they servants of Christ? And he knows this is, this is crazy what he's about to say. I'm out of my mind to talk like this. Are they servants? I am more. I've worked harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Oh, because it's against the law for you to get 40 lashes, so we'll just give him 39. And they did it five times. People don't even usually survive that. He had that five times. Three times I was caned with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Would you travel with this guy? This is unbelievable. Once is enough. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Jews. Everybody hates this guy. In danger in the city, in danger out in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored. And I have toiled, I have gone without sleep, I have known hunger, I have known thirst, I have often gone without food, I have been cold, and I have been naked. And then, in the very same letter, he says this, for our light and momentary troubles, wait, what? All that list we just read, he calls them light and momentary troubles? are achieving for us what? An eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul would also go on to write in Romans 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Wow. So last Sunday, I said, my challenge is this, to take the long view of suffering to pull back, to have that heavenly, eternal perspective. And when we do that, it changes everything. It wasn't to minimize pain. It wasn't to trivialize suffering that we go through. There's a lot of good people with a lot of scars right now. A lot of good people hurting. A lot of people, this is not to minimize any pain or suffering. There are deep wounds because we live in a broken world. Our goal is to rise above that, to pull back and see with that zoomed out, long view, to seek that heavenly, eternal perspective that comes our way in life, all right? So I want to paint a different picture. I want you to think about it this way. Let's say it's January 1st, 2021, okay? You wake up in the morning, and you can already tell it is about to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, just like the, the great movie that was made about. Okay, so I want you to look at this poster and pick who you are, okay? Got your guy? You wake up, first thing you notice something's wrong because your cheek's swollen and your tooth's starting to hurt just a little bit, so you call the guy that you don't want to call your dentist. And you go to him, and he says, oh, my goodness, I have bad news, and I have worse news. What do you want first? <laughs> the bad? I don't, I don't know. Bad news is your tooth is infected deeply, and you have to have a root canal immediately. The worst news is I have no antiseptic, no, no anesthesia. I have nothing to numb you up with, but it's critical. I'm running low. We'll see. We'll give it a shot. So you go through this procedure. On the way home, you are in such pain that you don't even pay attention to the red light that you just ran, and you crash your car. The people come. They tow it away. You walk the rest of the way home. As you get to the door, there's a notice that says from the IRS, you are being audited. You open the door. You find out your best friend has betrayed you. 
and your dog has left you. And it gets worse from there. It is, in every sense of the word, a no good, very bad, awful, terrible day. That's January 1. But you wake up the next day, and for the rest of 2021, every day gets better and better. In fact, it becomes terrific. For the next 364 days, guess what happens? Everything goes right. Things begin to turn your way. And I'm not talking little things. Surprises come dropping out of the air, almost from divine above, and you just start seeing what is happening. Your best friend wins the lottery and decides to give you all his winnings. So you have millions of dollars. You get promoted to the dream job you've always wanted, and you get to turn it down because you don't need the money. So you go in and work when you decide to. Time Magazine puts you on the cover of the magazine and says you are the best person who's ever lived. If you are single, you find love. You get married. Your marriage is unbelievable. You have your first child. Your wife insists that the boy be named after you. You get a chance to play professional golf against the number one player in the world, and you beat him every day. You come home. You sit down. You open up Netflix, and you have a year before anyone else the entire season of The Mandalorian, WandaVision, Cobra Kai, and The Chosen. And for a year, you are the king of the world because you are the spoiler king. You get to ruin everything for anyone who's ever bothered you. Things just get better and better. You take an awesome vacation paid for from your millions. You eat like a king. Everything you want, you satisfy everything, and you lose 10 pounds. (laughs) Your health is awesome. Your marriage is awesome. Everything is awesome for the rest of the year. It literally can't get better. Now, it's New Year's Eve, and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, how was your year? What's your response going to be? Your response is going to be, are you kidding? It was great. My year was great. What are you talking about? It's like, ooh, you're going to be like a kid on Christmas morning who says, ooh, sit down. Let me tell you about it. Now imagine if I go up and say, oh, really? But what about your first day? Oh. Oh, I don't forgotten about that. Yeah, that first day was kind of rough. But after that, this year had been so wonderful, I'd totally forgotten about it. This is what eternity with the Lord is going to be like times a million. Think about this. Think about it. This is a heavenly perspective. It's not denying your root canal. It's not denying your pain. It's not denying your suffering. That was real. But after 15 million years of bliss in paradise with your creator, your family, your friends, all those who know the Lord, the saints from a thousand years gone by, you will look back at your past as if it was a wisp of fog before the sunlight hit it in the morning. It will literally be like a wisp. So if someone asks you, hey, how has your existence been? You are going to correctly say, it's been wonderful. But but didn't you have a painful life? Oh yeah, that's true. But it pales in comparison to the wonders that God has given me since. And maybe, just maybe you could echo what Paul says. I consider that our present sufferings are not even worth comparing to the glory that's revealed in us. As you look around in your new paradise, God promises a time of no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering. We will be united with him, perfect harmony with friends and family and him forever and ever. Y'all, we cannot fully grasp how enjoyable, how fun, how awesome this is going to be. The scriptures even tell us, they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has even conceived. You can't even dream. Your best isn't even in the ballpark of how awesome it awaits. And maybe You just needed to hear that. Maybe in the middle of your suffering, I'm talking to somebody. You just needed to know, hang on. What awaits you? Your eyes haven't seen it. Your ear hasn't heard it. Even as good as Striper is, the music you will hear when you enter the gates. Thinking about this, if you love him and you have made him Lord and the Holy Spirit has taken up residence inside you, your present sufferings are about to be dealt with. It is a wisp on the grand scale of time. They don't even compare. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you a question. Our musicians can go ahead and come up. We're going we're to land the plane in a little bit of a different way here. I want to ask you a question. In light of what you've heard today, what is your decision? How will you handle your suffering? Will you allow it to make you harder or softer? Will you allow it to make you bitter or better? See, we just read what Jesus said in John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. 
You will have sorrow. You will have pain. We've all seen examples of this. And we've seen suffering take people and make them bitter. And we've seen that same suffering take people and make them better as they lean into God. Even though there's pain and suffering, God is promising to walk with us through that if we let him. In fact, God says he's even closer to those who suffer. Psalm 34, 18 says this, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted, to those, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Isaiah 42 says, this is what God, the Lord says, the creator of the heavens, the one who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I will take hold of your hand. This is God's promise. So his answer to our questions about suffering are right here. He says, I didn't create evil. I created free will so that you have the power to love me, the power to accept. I didn't create suffering. And while I don't like it, I can redeem it and I can make something good from it. God would say, suffering won't always be a part of the equation. Someday, I imagine sooner rather than later, someday God says, I will deal with it and I will wipe it away once and for all. And your bliss will be so strong that these present sufferings are not even worth comparing to. So we can decide, will we become bitter through this or will we become better? Because we all know people who have gone both ways. The words of Jesus are clear. He says, I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome world. I'm with you, always, even until the end of the age. So my question for us today as we bow before the Lord, what's your response? When you think of the grand scheme of our lives, will we pull back and take the heavenly perspective? Say, God, I'm thankful for these scars. I, I, I didn't think I wanted them, but I see what you've done with them. Will you use me to be a light to this world? Let's just bow together and take a moment before him. Father, we see the pain, we see the suffering, but we see it never more clearly than what your son endured on the cross. As we come close to that Easter and that Good Friday and that sacrifice we see so vividly portrayed, Lord, it becomes so real that you took true suffering, true pain, we see what your Apostle Paul went through and how many things he endured, and yet he pulled back and had such an awesome heavenly perspective. He says, these light and momentary, God, would you make us like that? Would you give us a heart after you that sees things through your eyes? God, help us not to be so focused on our pain, on our suffering. Help us not to be myopic and looking right here in front of us, Lord, but to look around and see what you're doing. God, give us eyes to see where we join you where you're working. Forgive us, Lord, for the complaints. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord, for any time I say anything that doesn't praise you. Through it all, you are good. Your love is vast. Your wisdom is unsearchable. God, I thank you that you gave us the privilege to know you as our Abba, Father. Lord, in the quiet of this moment, we bow before your majesty. We catch just a glimpse of it as we read Ezekiel and Isaiah. We look forward to the day we don't see dimly through a mirror. We see you face to face. Help us to live with that perspective today. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.